today's webinar hosted by uh, Dialysis Patient Citizens and the American Psychological Association. Uh, before we get started, I just want to review how this webinar will work. That, um, your active participation is important throughout the session. And right now, everyone is muted to avoid any background noise um, that may distract you from listening to the webinar. Throughout the presentation, um, I will be monitor monitoring the chat function if you are online, um, where you can answer questions and comments throughout the, box in the, throughout the presentation. Also, at the end of the webinar, if you um, if you'd rather ask your question in person, you can also use the icon on the control panel to raise your hand to indicate that you have a question or comment. Um, for those on the web function, it is towards the top of the page. Once you raise your hand, someone, I will unmute your line so that you can ask your question. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Haran Chamgosen, uh, the Executive Director for Dialysis Patient Citizens and the uh, DPC Education Center. Uh, as many of you know, uh, our mission is to improve uh, patient quality of life, uh, and we do that by focusing on empowering patients through advocacy uh, as well as education, which is one of the reasons we formed the, uh, uh, the DPC Education Center. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, before we jump in, I just you know wanted to you know, kind of reflect on a letter I recently received from uh, from the family member of a patient uh, who was talking about um, you know the fact that her husband, when uh, he was diagnosed with uh, kidney failure, uh, had mentioned that uh, you know unfortunately um, the the doctor had mentioned that you know dialysis was the slow goodbye, and they realized several months later that they were looking at dialysis um, as uh, a way to die instead of a way to live. And it wasn't until they you know, took that step back, recognized that, yes, on the one hand, dialysis isn't easy, but when they looked at it as an opportunity to live versus, um, you know, the alternative, that many patients uh, with other diseases don't have that option, their lives completely changed. And so that's one of the reasons why, um, and not only am I, but so many at, at DPC and the Education Center are, are passionate uh, about mental health. And that's one of the reasons we're so excited about this partnership with the American Psychological Association. Uh, in fact, I'd like to introduce our, our presenter today, which we're lucky, incredibly lucky to have with us, uh, psychologist Dr. Terry Bordeaux. Uh, she currently uh, is a consultant and trained therapist on evidence-based psychological treatment. Uh, previously, she was director of the Behavioral Health Clinics and professor at Oklahoma State University uh, Center for Health Sciences. Uh, Dr. Bordeaux uh, is incredibly familiar with both the physical and emotional aspects of managing kidney disease, uh, especially with the uh, uh, relation to dialysis patients. In fact, uh, her primary area of research for her doctoral degree uh, was with hemodialysis patients. So she recognizes that the accurate understanding of the medical regimen is key to helping patients most effectively manage their health. Uh, at the same time, please note that this webinar is for informational educational purposes. Uh, Dr. Bordeaux uh, will answer questions following a presentation, so please hold your questions for the time being. Um, however, she's not going to be able to respond to specific questions or comments about personal situations, um, and whether, whether it's appropriate diagnosis, treatment, or provide clinical opinion um, on this call. Um, that said, you know, uh, really excited to have Dr. Bordeaux on the call and a lot of terrific information that she's helped to de develop working with other renal professionals for this webinar, and so I'm going to turn it over to her right now. Thank you, Harant. I hope everybody can hear me well. Happy Sunday afternoon. Thank you so much for joining. Um, what I'd like to do is, first of all, thank Harant and Christy who organized all of the webinar um, and have done such a fantastic job of bringing us all together from around the country. Um, and then at the end, I will thank um, some of the people that I collaborated with have actually put this together because it seems like um, we all do this with joint efforts and, and thankful for really a lot of the help that I've received. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about my background because I think maybe that will help set the stage for why in the world you want to listen to Terry Bordeaux, the psychologist from Oklahoma. Um, I actually did do my dissertation with hemodialysis patients for a couple reasons. One, I, I had an interest in health psychology, medical psychology, how having medical conditions relates to um, feelings, behaviors, adherence, what we call adherence complying, following that regimen your physician talks to you about. And um, I was interested in pediatric hemodialysis kind of originally, but I'm actually married to a nephrologist, an adult nephrologist. And so 
Um, living with an adult nephrologist for 23 years, you come to learn a great deal about um, dialysis, the complications, um, and would talk to him frequently about things that patients were facing. So it became kind of a natural area of research for me is to start interfacing and talking with um, those patients and then became clinically interested um, in working with those patients later. Um, so, I'm, so that's kind of my background. I'm guessing that all of you here today have some sort of connection to kidney disease um, and dialysis. So it may be that one of you is experiencing um, these things, or maybe you're a family member who wants to do the best you can to support your loved one. So um, welcome, and we're glad you're here. Um, today we'll be talking about things like um, how we adjust our lifestyle habits, um, including kind of the emotions that can serve us and what can we do about that. We'll also talk about how families can be supportive and look at key factors related to life on dialysis and kind of talk about some ideas to help you and your family live well on dialysis. Um, and I like her aunt's comments about, you know, this is a way to live well. Um, this is not kind of a slow road um, to an end. This is actually um, to something more hopeful and um, an ability to kind of live fully. So we'll talk about that. And let me just make a comment. We'll open this up for questions at the end. So I've been given my watch, and I'm going to try to follow it so we have plenty of time for that because I really do want to hear from all of you. So when I, when I was asked to give this initially, um, we kind of did a phone conference. And what was important to me was really actually talking to the nephrologist first and saying, let me make sure that, you know, we have a really good basis for kind of understanding um, you know, the patients and what they're going through and what are the things that nephrologists want them to adhere to. So again, from my dissertation and from living with a nephrologist and from my work with patients, one of the kind of five key things that came up were um, that you have to attend scheduled dialysis appointments. Now, if you're an in-center, you know, dialysis, you're going somewhere. Um, some folks are having dialysis at home. It might even be daily. It might be every night. So again, you're having to do that, though, on a regular schedule. Um, you've also been asked to adhere to a daily fluid restriction. And we'll even talk about the word restriction and what that means to people when they hear restrict. Um, you've also been asked to stick to a certain diet and track phosphorus intake with every meal and snake, snack. And we'll talk about, you know, why phosphorus? Why do we care about that? Why is that important? And is it hard to do? Um, and then another kind of key area for patient's care was really maintaining those good relationships and open communications with all of the healthcare providers. And I can say in my work with medical patients, because that's been my primary population I work with, um, there is no doubt that coping and adjustment um, is so much improved when they feel like they've got open, positive, healthy dialogue with healthcare providers. So we'll talk about some of the ways to hopefully promote that and make sure that's happening for you. And, and again, some of this may be validation for many of you that you're already doing things really well, and that's wonderful. And then I put on here um, in talking with, you know, my nephrology experts, just really that for some patients, there's the possibility of kidney transplantation. And I think it's just important to note that um, that comes with it, and we'll talk about more, you know, some hopes. Um, expectations, um, what does that do to mood, what does that do to behavior, for an example, if you're kind of waiting for kidney transplantation. So that's sort of the basis for the talk, and we'll talk about all of those sort of psychological, emotional, psychosocial um, factors related to each of these. There was no doubt this was the highest rate of compliance um, or follow-through. People tended to do this, in part because if they did not attend dialysis regularly, um, it was obviously going to be pretty uncomfortable, um, and, and patients would report that. Um, so again, most all of you who have uh, kidney disease are attending dialysis at a center or are receiving in-home dialysis treatment, um, and it's likely that the majority of you are not missing the treatment. Um, and so waiting for the emergency treatment or the next regular appointment can be very stressful and uncomfortable, no doubt. Thus, most patients, you know, tend to attend regularly, um, despite the fact that, let's be honest, it's inconvenient for many patients. Um, there is a huge time commitment that oftentimes people didn't have in their life before they ended up on dialysis. Um, and this is a key component that can kind of affect adjustment of, as your schedule is likely changed or your flexibility in leaving home or town may have been affected. Um, psychologic, psychologically, patients tend to approach dialysis attendance with a variety of feelings and thoughts. 
Um, and one of the things I work with all my patients on is that patient feelings can change over time. Um, this can be a big change. Change, no matter what that change is in our life, can sometimes come um, with it some challenges, um, like inconvenience, time commitments, change in a daily routine. But I, I also emphasize it can bring about improved physical functioning and an improved quality of life. And so what's important um, is to recognize the range of emotions during the initial phases is actually really normal. And the more willing at this phase that you are to ask questions and discuss these changes with a caring healthcare provider and or your friends who understand, friends or family who understand, the less anxious most of us will feel. Um, additionally, dialysis patients often gain a sense of community, quite frankly, as they get to know the other patients and the staff or healthcare providers on the unit. And there was no doubt about this. When I was collecting my data, I basically parked myself for a month in dialysis units, and I was there from you know, morning shifts to night shifts. And I got to watch um, the different um, ambiance and community that would exist between the shifts and how people got to know each other, even sometimes in their little pods. And for many patients, that was something that was very soothing and comforting was to check in on their friend as they came in um, or their co-pod um, mate. Um, and so it's also important to note, too, that there's action, coping, um, whatever works for one person is what's most important. And some people like to go in there and have very quiet time. Other people like to communicate. And what's important is that everybody kind of recognize and find what um, helps you cope the most with kind of being on dialysis and in the unit, if you're in the unit. Um, so attending dialysis can be a, regularly can be a way to recognize there are others who truly understand what you're experiencing. Um, benefits of managing fluid intake. So again, we're kind of trying to change this up, that word restriction. When I talk to my patients about how do you feel when I say the word restrict, well, honestly, not many of us like to be restricted from anything. Um, we like to focus more on what we can control. Um, but managing that fluid intake can help people feel better physically and mentally. Um, it may make dialysis seem less intense because your body's having to work less um, hard um, when you haven't had a lot of fluid overload. And it makes people in general feel kind of more in control of their health. Um, so again, the doctor and nurse has probably told you that you have to, quote, restrict your fluids or manage them. Again, we're kind of working on what are some ways we can change some of that terminology. And whether that's water, juice, um, foods that are high in fluid, um, and they probably told you that fluid can lead to physical problems like weakening of the heart muscle or life-threatening shortness of breath from fluid accumulation in the lungs. Um, it's one thing to be told to change your fluid intake, and it can feel very different to actually have to do that and change that habit. Um, change, again, can feel hard. It can feel overwhelming, um, and people can feel restricted. So, again, one of the emphasis that I make is we, we tend to try to work with patients and are most successful um, when patients can begin to focus on what they can control um, rather than what they're having to restrict. And so managing basically fluid intake throughout the day can help patients feel like they're more in control of their health or make you feel like you're more in control of your health. Um, so if you don't manage your fluid intake, you feel those physical effects, physical challenges pose a challenge to our psychological well-being. So when our bodies are more tired or they're struggling, we can feel down have increased sadness or apathy about things that used to be fun for us. Um, in contrast, we can also feel more poorly or not as diligent about managing our health when we feel down or upset or angry or stressed or anxious. So what's important here is just being aware that the emotional states and how they affect us physically is just as important to maintaining our overall physical health. Um, in addition, being aware of how you feel when you follow your doctor's recommendations can help um, most patients focus more on what they can control rather than what they cannot. And you'll hear me say that a lot throughout this talk um, because it's real key in my office to helping pa patients feel really empowered to live well and to, be, um, to feel good about what they can take control of as far as their health. Um, when people feel something's beyond their control, you know, you may feel hopeless and depressed, whereas when you feel you can take charge of your behaviors or your thoughts, you feel more in command of your life. So another component we kind of talked about was that eating well and tracking daily phosphorus intake. Um, and here the emphasis really is a big part of taking care of yourself is going to involve how you eat and how you prepare food. 
Now, honestly, that's probably true for all of us in life. All of us should probably be more aware of what we put into our mouths and if we're eating well and we're eating healthy. And when I try to help my patients see that, that whether it's dialysis, whether it's diabetes, no matter what your focus is, that we all could probably improve um, our focus on eating well, they tend to feel less like, wow, this is something that happened to me. Nobody else that I know um, has to worry about this. But frankly, everybody should be thinking about living well. Um, and food is a big part of our lives. One of the things we talk about in my office a lot is it seems like when we talk about holidays or what we're doing on the weekend, I mean, I grew up in Oklahoma. It was like, what are you going to have at your barbecues? What are we having at the picnic? What are we having at the pool party? And we really meant, what are we having to eat? Um, and so it's sort of like, how can we, um, you know, what we all know and think about food, eating, and cooking comes from what we have learned growing up. Um, you may have favorite dishes um, and ways of preparing foods that are a part of your heritage and culture. Um, or for some of us, perhaps we grew up eating out instead of cooking at home. Um, food, again, may be central to things like family gatherings and celebrations. And it's important to just acknowledge that, um, and that's still wonderful and exciting, but kind of take control over um, what you take to those gatherings and what you can do to kind of promote health within your family and your community. Um, and so what we have to do sometimes is learn new things about food, get to be the best friend with your dietitian. I know the renal dietitians are um, in the units. Um, they're in the clinics. Um, like knowing what is phosphorus. Um, hopefully your doctor or nurse, if you've got those really good communications, has advised you um, to limit the amount of phosphorus you consume in food. And they tell you what those have, which ones have phosphorus in them, like dairy products and lentils. Um, so I want you to think about how did you feel when your doctor said you have to limit some of the foods you eat? Um, when they said the word restricted, they said the word limited, were there emotions that went along with that? Um, was that upsetting? Was that okay? Um, and so instead of thinking about it as restriction, um, we look at what choices do we have and how can we substitute some other favorite foods um, that are perhaps lower in phosphorus. Then the other part of that is the taking the phosphorus dining medications. Um, and instead of telling yourself it's a hassle, being able to reframe that thought and tell yourself things like, taking these binders allows me to actually enjoy some of the foods that I like. And what we encourage people to do is to start small. Instead of overwhelming um, yourself by thinking you have to dramatically change it all, you don't. Um, figure out what's a small step. Um, perhaps one step to figuring out how much phosphorus you typically consume um, is to keep a food journal um, and to track how much food you're eating so that you can start making those um, small steps. Um, again, this one's kind of straightforward, but it really needs to be emphasized because a lot of what gets talked about in my office is when communication is not good, when they feel like the provider's not listening, it's harder to feel on board. It's harder to feel excited and enthused about interacting and taking control of um, your health. So I encourage patients, um, and we find it's very helpful when they will prepare questions. Um, the physicians we trained at the medical school would say that when patients would come in with prepared questions, it actually allowed them to be more focused in their visits. Um, and they felt like when patients kept a notebook and took notes that they were actually listening and that they were trying to really become this active partner in health. Um, the other thing is we emphasize taking a friend or relative to health appointment. I've talked to many patients and many providers who said, you know, patients who said, I was overwhelmed. I, they told me this kidney disease. All I knew was dialysis. I didn't know what it was. Then they say I have to be, you know, on this, you know, multiple times a week for many hours. And they were so overwhelmed that it was hard to really take in all the information that would be helpful in optimizing health and managing health. Um, and it's also okay to follow up with your providers after those appointments. It's okay to make phone calls and ask um, to clarify, um, to get more information. And again, what we find is positive communication increases positive feelings about health management. Um, the other kind of point, again, we talk about those five areas you know, that are key to care is that for some patients, and I think this is important to say this, is they're thinking about transplantation. Um, and if you are a candidate for kidney transplantation, for many, the thought is this is a pathway off of dialysis. And what's important to emphasize is transplantation is a treatment, not a cure. And so it also comes with its own kind of regimen. Um, and as such, is not meant for every dialysis patient. So what's important for me when I'm working with my patients is just saying, are they viewing their life as being on hold until they get the transplant? 
or are they able to really stay in the moment, fully embrace life on dialysis, live well on dialysis, um, really get excited about the kinds of foods they can eat, uh, manage that, that fluid intake during the day. Um, because transplants do have its own challenges, such as rejection or necessity of taking those anti-rejection medications, frequent blood studies, physician visits, especially the first year after surgery. And again, for many, that's a wonderful option if they have it, and it can be life-changing. Um, but it, it can be very um, stressful and depressing if people are basically just waiting for transplant. And so what we do in my office is really focus on people's um, life being more than kidney disease and dialysis and that they can enjoy a fulfilled life while on dialysis and that people don't have to wait for a transplant in order to be happy. And what's really kind of interesting and fun is I'll ask people to describe for me what their interests are, their hobbies, um, what defines them, what makes them happy, and it's very interesting when they do that how dialysis isn't even typically in the description um, or the renal disease is something very small. And by doing this, sometimes we will literally put this all down in a picture, a visual in my office on a piece of paper and show them that really this is a small part of the overall life and that there's really so much more um, that they can be and want to be engaged in. Okay. All right, so again, adjusting to change. Change can be hard. Um, what we do is we encourage people just to acknowledge emotions. We all have change. Um, many people in your life have had change. Um, feelings can range, and that's normal. You may meet someone that's sitting next to you who seems like they're perfectly content and settled, while another person may be seeming angry. Someone else may seem depressed. Um, and what's really important here is just recognizing that everybody has a range of emotions. Um, you can think about how yours have changed over time, like the ones you're experiencing now, um, how they're different or similar to the ones you've experienced um, when there were other changes in your life, like moves, loss of a loved one, job changes, unexpected expenses, et cetera, and that we all have a variety of um, reactions to those. Um, they may be similar to what others experience. They may not. And what's really important is to recognize when someone feels stuck or cannot seem to feel better no matter what they try. And so we ask people to, to consider these questions. Do you complain all the time? Are you making excuses? Do you talk to others without listening? For example, you're only focused on your stress. Um, do you avoid people in situations? Are you doing unhealthy things to make yourself feel better, like overeating or spending too many hours watching TV instead of getting out and being active? Or perhaps you know someone who does this in your life. Um, and you see that maybe they're not adjusting to some change or some stressor in their life as well as they could. And so what we do is, um, you know, when I'm working with patients, I help them stay focused on what they can do um, and then help them understand what's beyond their control and try to figure out the difference between those. Um, and when they're stuck, um, we, we use coping strategies people know, like talking to others, getting up and being active, taking control of um, their medical regimen or recommendations from the physician, talking to their physician, doing enjoyable activities, actually scheduling those into the day. Um, and when that's not working, again, some patients will seek out a behavioral health provider or psychologist to help them identify ways um, that they're stuck and help them gain increased control over negative thoughts and maladaptive behaviors so that, again, the patient starts to feel in control of themselves and in control of you. Um, I just put this slide on here because I think what's important is that anytime we change a behavior, what's interesting to note is that I would say physicians in general are in the action stage of change. When you come into their office, they're ready for you to make changes. They're ready for you to make those lifestyle changes. They tell you what to change. But it may be that you're in pre-contemplation, which means you're not even considering change at the time. Um, for many of us, when there are health behaviors we need to change, like I might need to stretch more. I may, might need to um, you know, eat healthier eat more vegetables. I might be like, well, that would be good for me, but I don't really feel like doing that. Again, are we, which stage are we in is really important to recognize because basically we want to get motivated to kind of move along um, that continuum. So I always encourage people to think about where they are in this process because sometimes if your physician's in action stage and you're in contemplation, sometimes we dig in kind of naturally because we don't want to be told what to do. So again, I try to, you know, invite my patients to make healthy choices, but I try not to tell them what to do. Um, and then I also try to inform everybody the process of change. That when we make progress, we generally go up and down a little bit, but in general the trend is up, so meaning that we're maintaining change. And so what's really critical kind of on this slide is just recognizing 
um, that knowing that change is up and down, it's not just a straight line up, is that it helps many of us keep moving when we might want to give up, and that this is an actual really normal process of change. And actually, um, many of you probably changed behaviors in the past, and if you think about the behaviors you changed, it probably looked very much like this. You might have taken two steps forward and a step back, um, but continued to move forward. And what you notice is if you look at those lower dips, um, they never go back to baseline because you're continually improving and making change. So one of the things that we explain, again, the evidence and the research is very clear. Um, people that function the best and are generally engaged in the most positive uh, mood states tend to, tend to recognize that link between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And when they're feeling down, they start to identify behaviors that make them feel more positive. And we know that sometimes there are thoughts that help us to feel more positive about making certain behavior changes, um, and that certain positive thoughts help us to actually feel better. Um, so it's clear that if people feel, you know, their thought is, you know what, dialysis is a way for me to live well and optimally. Um, and actually, if this had been, you know, 70 years ago, I wouldn't be able to do as well. But now we have this means to live much better their feeling is generally going to be better than if they're kind of thinking more negatively about that and focused more on the hassles of it or the time commitment. So one of the things I try to emphasize on my talks, and again, I want to make sure that we have you know, plenty of time at the end of this um, for you to ask questions, is that you are the expert on you um, and your experiences, um, and that I'm just here, you know, I really, as a psychologist, you know, I'm giving you a talk on living well with a chronic condition, um, but you're the ex expert on your own experience of renal or kidney disease, and you know best how this and dialysis impacts your life. And the other thing I think is important is each one of you arrived at kidney disease very differently. Um, you all were different people. You had different temperaments. You have different attitudes, feelings, thoughts, habits, behaviors. Um, and yet, there, we know there are common reactions that many of you have likely experienced. So it means you're not alone in that. Many people have had changes in their life, whether it be dialysis, diabetes, you know, whatever that is. And you want to ask yourself, what was going on in my life before dialysis? Um, for many of my patients, they had other different stressors um, that were going on. They may have had different stressors going on before. For some, everything was great. And a, dialysis was a big adjustment. And so we, we focus on remembering what people enjoyed about life before dialysis and really trying to enjoy those things again and getting back to that um, and just keeping in mind that you may cope differently than your neighbor. Um, and, and my hopes are that this talk will support people in making their own choices about how they can live well with dialysis because what one person takes from this call and goes out and changes or does differently or validates themselves for may be different than what somebody else does, and that's perfectly okay it's that everybody's going to cope differently. And I think it's also important to note that, you know, individual differences can be shaped and influenced by cultural and ethnic background, too. And so um, sometimes our cultural heritage and ethnicity can influence our health behaviors, particularly around food and eating. And it may or may not be that others or your health care provider completely understand that. And it's important to be able to convey that and understand how does that impact you and how can you incorporate that in as you're living with, well with dialysis um, without feeling like that's discounted or somehow um, less important? Okay. So again, when we talk about the journey, um, the focus is really on this is a means by which people get to live healthy. Um, they can feel more positive about um, how this has really given them something new. Um, some way to um, make life so much more improved. Um, the journey can be, can be difficult for some. It also can be full of positive surprises, um, people that you meet that you wouldn't have otherwise met, insights you have about yourself or others, um, increased appreciation um, of things around us. For a lot of people, they simply feel a whole lot better once they're on dialysis, and that alone is enough to really help improve feelings about managing health. Um, I put on here chronic um, versus acute because for some, you've had that this process has been years of monitoring and awareness of what was coming. For others, it was rather sudden with little time to contemplate or plan. And what's important is just noting that people have different experiences and you, again, are the expert on you. 
Um, and then gain versus loss. Um, given what we've already talked about kind of regarding control over our lives, um, the journey can be viewed as one of losses, time away from work, loss of job, loss of control over kidney function, or one of gain, um, a way to live well, a solution to a challenge, a means to meeting new people and experiencing life in a more full way than if one did not have this treatment. Um, I put in here isolation versus communication. It's just that concept of we all have moments we need and want to be alone. Um, and when the thoughts in our head are good and positive or you can challenge the negative depressing thinking, then alone can be quite valuable. Um, and what I tell my patients is when we're stuck in our heads in a negative pattern of thinking, we can get quite depressed. Um, and I tell my patients, this is like walking down a dark alley in a dangerous place in the middle of the night. We don't want to go there alone. And this is a cue kind of dust if we're kind of stuck in negative depressive thinking. They're reaching out and working with others, getting outside of their own head by checking out those thoughts can be much healthier. Um, this is also an individual journey. You're the expert on you, yet this is also a collective knowledge from other patients, healthcare providers, friends, family, mental health professionals. That's part of why I'm talking to you today who can support you on your journey. Um, and research does show us that most do better with some support. Um, so support is tailored to your individual needs and exists in multiple ways, meaning for some support is you know, their favorite pet at home that they get to come home to every evening. For some, support is a, a very large church group. For others, it's, a, it's the neighbors next door. For others, it's children or it's parents or it's siblings. So I think what's important here is that um, support can be, you know, many things to many people, but some type of social support is important. Some people actually even have support through online communities, or DPC providing this can be a very supportive environment, and they have lots of wonderful programs to help support. Um, and that what we try to emphasize in my office is that patients can live well on dialysis and because of dialysis. And that dialysis offers um, you options so you can figure out how to claim the life you want to live. And it's important to think about what else defines you in life. What do you enjoy? What makes you feel good about life? Um, is the weather nice today? It's nice here. Um, is it conversations with others, um, smiling at other people, them smiling at you, your job, um, relationships with others, concern for others? One of the things that we emphasize in my office, too, is that research is clear that if we are feeling kind of depressed or focused on something that's happening to us we don't like, that if we will actually volunteer or give to others, we tend to find that we're happier. Um, and, it was, you know, my dad um, has type 2 diabetes and had to begin taking insulin. And he was not very excited about, you know, the shots. And he said, Terry, I remember you telling me about the kids you see who take their shots multiple times a day and they are fully engaged in sports and life and, and they just don't seem bothered by it. And he, he said, and I realized this just wasn't a big deal. So it's kind of a way that he made sense of it and got outside of himself and realized that other people have other challenges too and that he could approach it in a way that would help him feel more positive. Um, and that, again, dialysis doesn't define you. It's just one aspect. Um, so kind of finally, one of the things I, I like to wrap up with is how important that support is. Um, that studies show that people are more likely to follow health routines when they have a strong support network. And one of the things we talk about a lot in my office is the challenges when people don't feel initially like we have support or they have support, and we talk about who support can be. Um, and so when people have that support in their lives, it helps people kind of manage good and stressful days. And that's true, like I said, whether it's renal disease and dialysis or whether it's job is stressful or whether it's the economy um, or whatever has kind of been stressful for people that day. Um, some people find support from family, friends, coworkers. It's different for all of us. Um, and what's critical here is that you can be an advocate for yourself by talking to your family, your friends, your health care providers about what you need. Um, if you're a relative to someone who is on dialysis, dialysis, asking that person how you can support him or her. Um, we sometimes make assumptions um, because we're close that we know what our loved ones need, but honestly that can sometimes be an unfair assumption. And it's always safe to start that conversation asking what we can do to help. Um, the other thing that we as, um, you know, family and friends don't want to do is be the health police. I work in an obesity clinic, and I tell people, you know, this person's already trying to struggle to lose weight and get healthier. We don't want to police them because that feels very judging and can be very stressful. So when it comes down to it, the person who's on dialysis has to make decisions 
um, for him or herself. And it's important to have open, ongoing communication about, you know, what is going on in their life and what that experience is like. Um, and sometimes things change and your loved ones may need support in a different way than they did before. Um, your loved one may need more help when they're first diagnosed. They might need less as time goes on or vice versa, but communication can be key. So I think I'm going to turn this back over to Christy um, because I'm kind of done with the presentation part and we'll end up opening it up for questions. Great. Um, actually, what perfect timing and what a perfect segue because we do have a question on chat. Um, and Excellent. Cool. Yeah, and before, let me just remind everyone that um, Dr. Boudreaux, or Bordeaux, excuse me, is not able to respond to specific questions or comments about personal situations, diagnosis, treatments, or provide any clinical opinions. But our first question um, comes from uh, M. Brennan, and they wanted to know, or wanted, or were asking about the differences between in-center hemodialysis and home dialysis, um, saying that home dialysis patients are more often on their own. And she's wondering how they're able to build stronger support networks, if you have any suggestions for that. That is an awesome question. Um, and that does come up, interestingly uh, enough, in my office at times, because I see both patients who are in the center, um, and then I see patients who are at home. And sometimes the way that what I would say is this is kind of from my standpoint and experience and from being married to a nephrologist is, is really that um, in your clinic with your getting to know your nurse, your dietitian, um, they oftentimes the um, dialysis unit, different programs, sometimes even the doctor you're seeing will have picnics or they'll have um, opportunities to come out and meet other patients. <clears throat> Any of those kinds of social opportunities to get involved. Um, I know here in Tulsa we have, like, we for many years had runs that would support transplant programs or would support um, kidney research or a variety of organizations. Um, and patients would say, I got to meet some people um, that I would never have met otherwise, and it made me feel less alone. So I think that's a fantastic question um, because I think that can be a real challenge when you're receiving dialysis at home. Um, and you don't get to meet other people. So through your clinics, I would say, um, again, sometimes there are some community um, activities, sometimes online forums, um, where patients get together and can dialogue and talk. But it can be a real challenge. Thank you for the just question. Building on that, uh, thank you for the, the response, uh, Dr. Wardo. I just wanted to also add, and it's uh, actually a really great segue. I know uh, she actually alluded to the programs that we have at, at DCC earlier, including you know, just wanted to let people know that uh, many of you I know are, are patient ambassadors and participate in monthly conference calls and get to meet others, um, you know, through, uh, through our various programs. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities as well um, through our online forum as well as some of our, our grassroots advocacy. We're even starting regional meetings, which uh, APA is going to be participating in and having psychologists uh, per, uh, participate in some of these, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one discussions. Um, so there's uh, obviously a lot of opportunities both for in center as well as uh, home dialysis patients, and, and I definitely wanted to encourage all of you to look to DPC as an opportunity to network as a patient-led organization. You know, all of our board members are ESRD patients, um, whether on dialysis or, or transplant, and uh, so I uh, really feel fortunate to have the opportunity to, to work, you know, uh, with and for all of you too. And so, actually, I do want to jump in and ask one more quick question too before uh, Christy kind of, you know, uh, continues to monitor the questions and. And Dr. Werder, that was, you know, two slides really jumped out to me. Um, and I thought it actually kind of go really well together. The first one um, about you know, building a good relationship, you know, with your healthcare professionals. And then the second one about um, the fact that, you know, patients, dialysis patients, they're the actual expert on their health. And I remember you hearing you, I think, last time talk about how um, if you have questions or come prepared for your meetings with your health professionals, that it's actually a real positive. And they look at that even more positively. And as an organization that focuses on empowerment, I'd really like you to talk a little bit more kind of about those two together. Yeah, so, so um, and that, your good communication with healthcare provider. And then Harant, tell me the first slide. Oh, and so the, the slide about good communication with your healthcare mm -hmm. provider. And then you uh -huh. also talk a slide about, you know, you're the expert. You know, you know your oh, condition. Right, right. You're the dialysis patient. 
And so I just wanted to you know, kind of reiterate to our members and patients who might be reluctant, who might be like, well, they're the you know, clinical experts and they know the numbers or you know, the diagnosis or what have you. And, and uh, actually, you had, on a, I think a previous discussion, it really emphasized that, well, you know, um, it's actually very much appreciated, you know, whether it's from your husband or other oh. health professionals, to right. have a list of questions and, and be prepared. Yeah, and let me just say that one of the things I encourage my patients to do, and we do a lot in my office, is we talk about how to communicate in a way. Sometimes you're right, they feel intimidated. But that, in fact, if they'll go in there with questions, and when they don't understand, um, what I find that health care providers really like is when they say, gosh, I, I really want to take good care of myself. I want to do exactly what you're telling me to do. Can you help me understand why this is important? Or can you help me problem solve um, that in my life um, it's hard to fit that in because of this? Um, and I love that because when the healthcare provider feels like, oh, my gosh, this person is truly motivated and more in that contemplation or action stage of change, that motivates the healthcare provider to feel even more invested in the care. Most of them are invested. But when you have a patient that really is willing to ask those questions in a way that can help them um, optimize their health, frankly, the healthcare provider is going to look better if the patient takes better care of themselves, right? And the patient's going to feel much better. And along those lines, Tarant, I kind of want to jump to, I had a couple questions, you know, I asked, Jim, you know, a nephrologist, I said, so what are some of the questions you get in your office? And what I love is he's got really good connections. And one of them was, um, he asked me, what do I do? He said, patients say, I get anxious before my treatment. What can I do to feel calmer? And I love that he has patients that he has a good enough relationship. They can ask him questions like that, where he has enough expertise and experience, you know, psychologically to be able to help them learn how to take those deep breaths reframe that thinking, um, bring activities that they find pleasurable while they're on dialysis. And he's actually able to provide them suggestions um, or even help advocate for a referral if that patient is finding themselves really distressed um, about any part of the process. I want to make sure that we get other questions before I start jumping in with questions um, that I've been asked. Um, we do have another question on chat. Great. Um, from she was wondering um, if possibly, she said if you thought that units should offer more like amenities to make patients more comfortable, um, whether or not something like that could possibly, I suppose, pro improve the individual's experience and outlook. Um, she suggested things like blankets, movies, et cetera. Now, I love that question because it's very interesting. You know, there was, the Friday night dialysis unit group, they were hilarious. They got together, and they literally had movie and popcorn night. <laughs> so they would have, like, and, and literally they all looked forward to their Friday night dialysis because they were going to come together. And that group actually kind of planned activities that made it, you know, a little bit better. Another uh, comment I heard from someone is that the chair gets very uncomfortable when they have to sit there and that it's actually very important to adhere to the total time of your regimen. And some patients want to get off early because it's tiring, they have other things to do. But then we know that their health is much better long term um, if they can adhere to the time that the doctor wants them on the machine. Um, and so bringing things like a cushion to sit on that's way more comfortable for you. Um, a blanket if you're too cool that's your own and kind of having that backpack of, you know, amenities, so to speak, when in fact you feel like not all the amenities you might like are in the dialysis unit. So again, it's sort of that taking control of what you can and really making that experience um, like how can you take a little mini piece of um, pleasure or happiness in there with you and bring things that make you feel good. Thanks. Actually, right off of that, um, Hillary also had a question via chat. And this one, personally, I'm also as curious about. Um, she wants to know, how do you make telling your employer of your diagnosis less stressful? OK, so that, I mean, that's an interesting question because that comes with it, you know, like what I would want to know as a provider is, what's the stressful part? Is it is stressful because you fear that they're not going to want to let, you know, that they're not going to be flexible. Um, 
And so what I really encourage my patients, no matter what it is that they have to share with a provider, because I see patients with many conditions, which means multiple doctor's appointments, is that um, generally when you have really good rapport and communication with your employers, that going in and being able to have just open conversation about, you know, exactly what that's going to mean um, and a willingness and flexibility to do what you need to do to make that work within the schedule that my patients, and that's what I would say is this is from my experience with my patients who have, that do find that stressful and have had the hardest um, or the easiest time, I should say, um, are the ones that had really good communication about, listen, this means that I'm going to have to, you know, be out of um, the office at these times, but I can make it up here, or I'd like to be flexible here. Um, or working with dialysis units, you know, many of my patients that work would go into the early shift, um, and then that might mean that they go into work slightly late on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, or perhaps Tuesday, Thursday, but they went in earlier other times. So again, it's sort of that going in, um, trying to really be proactive about um, their own flexibility and motivation to keep, you know, working well. Thank you. Um, we have one more question on chat, and then we'll go over and uh, turn it over to see if there's any questions just via the phone. Um, the question is yeah, thank about... You. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Please go ahead. No, I just want to make a comment that I love what this one person... I get very excited and passionate about this because I have watched patients get really empowered to take amazing care of themselves. And I like what somebody said on chat about um, Julie, if I could point that out, that attitude is a huge part of making your time on dialysis less stressful um, and kind of being able to roll with whatever's going on makes it easier to deal with. And I really love that because when I spent the month in the unit, they got to know me, I got to know them. And it was almost like a party when I would show up. Like people would come around and go, hey, are you bringing me your survey? Hey, are you going to come talk to me? You know, and and I found that, like, we, we ended up having this really good time despite the fact that, you know, they were, they, they had to be there. Do you know what I'm saying? But they seemed like they were excited. And, and, I, and it made that attitude part, um, you know, really stand out for me. Thanks for sharing uh, Julie's comment with those on the phone as well. I know not everyone's able to see it here on the chat. Yeah, um, that was awesome. Yeah, another great question popped in from um, Jennifer wondering about uh, patient burnout for folks on dialysis for more than 25 or 30 years. Um, what kind of suggestions? So that, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just what kind of suggestions do you have for those patients who have been on for such a long period of time? So that is actually a really good question. And we talk about burnout in my job a lot um, across the board for almost whatever we're working with, dealing with, whether it's, um, you know, caregivers who are taking care of children with special needs um, or um, people who've dealt with kind of major chronic medical problems or um, having to continue to work at a job that they find fairly stressful. And, and I'm not trying to minimize um, that burnout, but just to say that we use a lot of the same techniques. And, and that's really acknowledging, yes, I'm having burnout. Ooh, I'm really tired. Sometimes just acknowledging and not feeling bad that you feel that way can help people feel kind of validated that that's okay. But then also helping them understand whether it's dialysis, whether they're dealing with something else that's kind of chronic and long-term, who can give us a moment of pause where we say, I'm burned out. What can I do to reframe my thinking? What can I do to change my life in a way that I can change it? And again, I can't change the dialysis, but can I change my thinking and saying, wow, if I've been on this 25 or 30 years, that was 25 or 30 years that I got to live better than I would have if we did not have dialysis treatments. Wow. And in fact, some of my folks who are having that burnout, I talk to them about what an inspiration they are for some of the young people I see that come on. And they say, wow, she's been doing this for 25 or 30 years. What does she have to teach me? Or what does he have to teach me? Sometimes those folks, if I can help them see that they're role models, they're mentors, they have done something that so few have done. They've done something that's pretty amazing, incredible, can help a lot of my folks go, yeah, you know, I'm burned out, but I'm also getting older. You know, like maybe I need a shift in my routine. Maybe I need to change it up. Maybe I need to do something else in my life. Maybe I need to reframe. My thinking, maybe I need to be a mentor role model 
Um, and that might mean pairing yourself next to somebody who's new at it and scared and nervous. And you, you look at them and say, I've been doing this 25 to 30 years. Look at me. I've been able to do this. But great question. Thanks. And again, uh, Julie remarked that she's in that boat. She was diagnosed 35 years ago. And mm -hmm. to embrace it and share what you have learned. So that's definitely something that I think can be uh, utilized in clinics, especially with patients that have had this disease for such a long period of time. Um, Absolutely. Why don't we go and give an opportunity for those who are not on the web portion but only on the phone. Are there any questions via phone? If so, um, you can unmute your line by pushing star six or pound six. No questions yet, it sounds like. So there's still another one hanging in chat. So we can just keep the discussion going. And if something comes up, feel free um, to unmute your line and um, jump in when available. Um, another question in chat was in regards to opening that communication with your healthcare provider. Um, like the question was sort of, if you're already in a relationship with your nephrologist that seems very um, limited to providing prescriptions and just a very, I suppose, stern business relationship, what kind of steps can you take to really give the patient the sense that they're in control and that they can make that active approach in uh, opening that conversation with their nephrologist? So, so part of what I do is I, I call this, and this is kind of a communication strategy, I call the positive sandwich, <laughs> where we try to actually, when we feel like somebody is um, fairly kind of business, maybe pretty academic, or, you know, just really trying to get their job done, and they're experts in it, and they're great at it, but maybe not the best at, like, communicating or getting close to you, is really probably reinforcing how, how much they give you great information, and you so appreciate, you know, that they're really helping you get well. So you almost set them up for what you're getting ready to say next, which is how can you help me or how can I get more information or how can I increase, you know, my um, involvement in my care. So you kind of then couch whatever you want to say between positive messages, if that makes sense. You kind of validate and reinforce what they're doing for you. You kind of ask um, in a small bite kind of what you need or want and then, you know, frame it at the end with you so appreciate their time. You appreciate that they're willing to give you. Um, suggestions and feedback. And I've had many patients um, be able to start opening up dialogue by doing some of those you know, positive communication strategies. And again, it may be something that seeking a, a behavioral health provider who's expert in some of these things can help people with, um, you know, so that you really do learn how to become that advocate, you know, advocate. Sometimes it's a matter of a physician to physician. We all have our own personalities. And it may be that the dialysis unit nurses become the person who kind of helps you get dialogue going. Um, or maybe it's your dietitian you can get some specific questions from if, again, they're related to those person's areas of expertise um, and help them understand, you know, how can you get the most out of your care um, with those physicians? Because, again, we all come with different temperaments and attitudes and personalities. And I, can I say one more thing, Christy? I, I know that... Um, I want to kind of go back to, for people who've lived on dialysis for a very long time, um, at some point we, we get to a point where we've been on dialysis for a really, really, really long time, and people start saying, listen, where do I want to go with this? What do I want to be doing? You know, I want to take control over my life in the way I want to. And I just think it's important also to really be open to having that conversation with your physician when you're feeling burned out, um, to talk to them about that. Um, because sometimes I, I feel like patients also need to be able to say, wow, I'm getting burned out, I've been on this all this time, and, and be able to open up dialogue with their physician about um, ways to make that easier or things they can do. Great. We don't have anything waiting in chat. Um, is there, are there any other questions from our phone participants? Well, Terry, do you have anything else to add? Any experiences you can um, 
in you like excuse me, any questions that have come up that you've encountered on ice was on a frequent basis, something you'd like additionally to address here? Yeah, so let me, um, there were a couple of things that I had, and then I'll, I'll wrap this up, because I know this is Sunday afternoon, and I want everybody to get back to really enjoyable activities, including this one. Hopefully this has been mm -hmm. helpful to some. Um, but I've had people ask, I feel so thirsty all the time, how can I manage the thirst? And I think that's a really important um, question to ask patients, because, or to talk about, because there are lots of things in our life that are difficult or challenging, but we know it's better for us if we do it. And it's sort of that if we can take control of managing all day long, that helps. Um, and being able to kind of schedule when I'm going to get to have something and what I'm going to get to have that's kind of enjoyable for me can help us have times where we push it off a little bit longer. And recognizing some of that thirst is the physiologic, you know, kind of that medical thirst. The other part is that psychological, kind of that notion if we say that we're restricting, somehow we want more of it. And the more you think you can't have it, the more you want it. Um, so really reframing that as, no, I'm actually going to take control of this and I'm going to manage it. And yes, I'm thirsty, but I can also manage this. Just like sometimes I'm tired, but I can't go to sleep right now. Um, and so that's a question I get asked, and I try to really help people with how can we reframe that and how can you kind of manage it throughout the day so that you feel more in control of that. Um, and then another one I thought was a great tip is uh, people will say, what about those phosphorus medications? I have a really hard time taking them all the time. But one of the things that's emphasized by the physician that um, I know really well is that a concept of availability, um, that if you will have it in your car, in your purse, in your bag, in your truck, um, with you on your person, people are way more likely to take them. And really emphasizing that, um, and I didn't say this in the talk, that it's a little bit like cigarette smoking um, does not in the very short-term immediate have a bad consequence for people, but it's that long-term cumulative effect. So it's like phosphorus binders. It's like if you can take them more long-term over time, it's better for your body than if we're not taking that because you have that cumulative kind of negative effect when you don't do it. So again, make that convenient and have it kind of on the person and be right there. The more we make it part of our routine, kind of like brushing your teeth, it would feel odd if you didn't brush your teeth. For most people that brush their teeth every day, if you can make taking phosphorus binders a habit like that, you just won't forget. And if you do, it will feel wrong. It will feel like, like you forgot something that, and you should go do it. But I also want to thank everybody for coming today and giving me the opportunity um, to get to participate in this because, again, I'm an expert on coping and adjustment and helping patients, but you know the patients that are on this call and the friends, you guys are experts on you and your experience. So I tried to make general statements today that I hope are, are helpful to folks, um, but in no way do I want to say that I know what your exact experience is like. And if you ever feel like you want something more, again, there are fantastic psychologists and healthcare providers out there. Um, who would love to be helping kind of people get empowered to optimize their health and live well on dialysis. So thank you. Dr. Rogo, um, this is Ryan. I wanted to thank oh, you sorry, again sorry. for not only uh, putting together this outstanding presentation for all the feedback and, and questions that you answered, uh, but also, you know, I mean, you've also helped us develop an outstanding template for psychologists to use at upcoming meetings. and. So for those of you who weren't aware, um, this is, I think, just the beginning of our collaboration with the American Psychological Association, thanks to Dr. Wardo. Um, and we've actually got four different regional meetings in the next few months coming up, including the first one in Detroit. And not only are we going to be talking about mental health, but two other areas that we continue to hear feedback from patients are their choices uh, for their physical health. So talking about, as she had mentioned, transplantation, the home dialysis, the in-center, um, you know, those options and answering those questions, including, you know, uh, questions related to diet. Um, and then obviously we'll have a similar se session on mental health. And then, you know, finally we'll talk uh, about, you know, further patient empowerment through advocacy uh, and tips and, to uh, and tools uh, to uh, help you become an even better advocate for yourself. And so on that note, I do want to thank, you know, Dr. Bordeaux again for all of her effort and help not only with this presentation, but helping us to uh, further uh, elevate you know, patient awareness uh, regarding uh, mental health and the impact that it can have uh, for patients on dialysis patients on their overall physical health. And so thank you again. And thank you to everyone else who participated in today's call and for all the great questions. It's just a terrific dialogue. And Harant, can I really quickly, this is uh, Terry Bordeaux. I just want to thank everybody from APA, Caitlin, Luana, um, Joanne Smith um, from the DPC Education 